Just yesterday I was reading in an old New Yorker an article about a very famous Italian novelist. Can you hear me, everybody? Mm -hmm. yes. Elena Ferrante, who I haven't read. She's very <laughs> hot now, apparently. And uh, when she sent her first novel to the, her publisher, she wrote, or this is the writer writing about her, she will do nothing for the book because she has already done enough. She wrote it. <laughs> She won't take part in discussions or conferences and won't go to accept prizes if any are awarded. And then she wrote, I will be inter interviewed only in writing, but I would prefer to limit even that to the indispensable min minimum. She wrote, I believe that books, once they are written, have no need of their authors. If they have something to say, they will sooner or later find readers. If not, they won't. And on and on. And I say, same goes for films and filmmakers, don't you think? <laughs> But here I am, for the last time, I'm returning, I'm retiring from being a filmmaker here and now, and now I have witnesses. <laughs> Nevertheless, to the business at hand. Films should live without the bloody filmmaker attached to them, don't you think? I mean, they should, if they're worth anything, work. But here we go, and the rain is finally starting. Uh, way before I had a name for these kind of films, I had made in 1986 a film called Far From Poland, a film about the solidarity movement in Poland, shot entirely in the United States, far from realist, wouldn't you say? I couldn't get visas for myself and a camera crew to get into Poland in 1981 when the strike started. Poland was drowning in foreign film crews every TV network, every national newspaper from every country, and hundreds more were piling into Warsaw to witness, record, perhaps the first huge break in what I call the sinister symmetry of the Cold War. I was in Poland when it started, but had to come back to the States to raise money, which I did easily, but then no visas. I moaned and groaned for a few months until one day a friend, a composer, said to me, just make it here, God damn it. What? I screamed at him. But I did make a film here about Poland. And for me, it was the beginning of a huge turn in my own filmmaking. The idea that I could make a film about the Solidarity Movement without my very own interview with Lech Wałęsa standing in front of the Gdańsk shipyard gates. And I had, it was very hard, and I had to invent everything that's in the film, but it weaned me off this notion of footage, documentary footage, documentary as we know it, um, and into a different place where I had to think much better about why and what the film, and how to tell what, there, what it was I understood and knew, and what I wanted to promote about a certain situation. So um, it took four years to make it. I, I made up everything. You know, it's, <laughs> it's full of Polish jokes. It's, it has reenactments of a lot of important texts that came out of the Solidarity Movement. It has soap opera sequences between myself and my boyfriend. It has, uh, uh, what else does it have? Melodrama, uh, reconstructions of important documents like the 21 Accords that settled the strike. Um, it was exhausting and exhilarating, but finally I think I made a film much more relevant to the subject than anything I could have shot in Poland if I had been able to run around and go to solidarity meetings here, there, and everywhere. So it really started me down a path which I didn't have the name for then, but now I call, I think I'm the only person who calls it this post-realist nonfiction filmmaker. Post-realism mainly in the sense that its uh, credentials, its reason for being, is not based on, I got the footage, I shot this here, I found that guy who said this, I put it here, I put it there, right. That, what I call the pedigree of the real, which most nonfiction films trade in. There are a million other things, I don't want to do a lecture on post-realism, I've done it, but um, after Far From Poland, I mean, the two films I've made since then I would call post-realist in that they exist not to prove that these people then said this standing in that field or in front of that building or whatever. 
um, but because I had an idea about what needed to be spoken about something and I had to find a way to do it. So <clears throat> maybe that's why, having made Far From Poland in 86, I think, 84, when in 1991 someone tipped me off to go see a retrospective of some films uh, by this unheard of German filmmaker, Harun Faroki, this strange thing happened to me. I saw uh, Faroki's second film, which is called Inextinguishable Fire, and I was stunned. I remember it physically, sitting in the back of the anthology and going, holy shit, this is how you, we should be making films. Um, I'd been making documentaries for about 20 years by then, and then this film comes along, 1969 film, so it's already 25 years after the film was made in black and white, in German, in just 20 minutes, Faroki demonstrated exactly how a company like Dow Chemical organized the labor of its chemists and engineers to make, quote, a better napalm. There had been a napalm before the Vietnam War. It was used in Korea, I think also in the South Pacific during World War II, but the Department of Defense, it was called then, wanted a better napalm, which consisted of at least two things inextinguishable. You could be on fire with an apom, jump in a lake, come out and be burning still. Uh, and I just blocked it up. Inextinguishable, doesn't matter. That's enough. <laughs> and Dow Chemical had a contract to develop this better napalm. Um, so what's in Verrocchio's film is it a kind of demonstration. I love this word, this idea of a demonstration, somebody, we all should think about using it, um, of how Dow Chemical would get the various chemists, various engineers to develop this thing without ever talking about making napalm. Have you got a plastic, oh, that was the other one, Indistingu inextinguishable and would stick to human skin. Okay, and in fact, a plastic that somebody was working on for rubber soles, in fact, turned out to be the additive to the uh, gasoline, basically, that meant you couldn't brush it off. You burn down to the bone, basically, if you got caught in it. Um, so he did it all without any reality footage. He did it all with uh, stand-ins. Uh, German friends of his standing in for these chemists at Dow Chemical or whatever by uh, allegory. Um, primarily, I'd say it's a film about labor, how labor can be organized to make whatever <laughs> the company you work for wants made, including the labor of a professor whose labor is put together with other professors' labor to produce students of just certain sorts. So I thought it was the most useful and the most radical film I'd ever seen. And um, realized that this is 25 years after the Vietnam War was over. Uh, Vietnam was not Faroki's war. You know, mostly documentaries get made for their own national audiences about the sins of their own country, let's say. Um, that become national issues. What was extraordinary about Faroki's film, this little German film made for 5,000 Deutschmarks, shot one to one, not 20 to one, the way people were shooting, and now probably 100 to one, the way people are shooting digitally, um, was that, that it had a generosity of, uh, of address, let's say. It was to everyone. It wasn't to Germans. It wasn't even to Americans. It was a demonstration about how things happen. He says in the film, you can't stop a war on the battlefield. You have to stop it in the factories where the shit's made. And, uh, and he demonstrates exactly that uh, in this film. Underrepresentation, stand-ins by German friends for uh, Dow's American scientists, a burning dead dead lab rat for a fleeing Vietnamese peasant on fire with napalm. 
this I think is one of my favorite things, 16 very short shots from the US evening news program of the time. Shots we watched every night for 10 years. Plain soldiers, scorched, fleeing, refugees, napalm burns, jeeps, General Westmoreland in a sequence that he repeats twice, not to present the war to us at home, but to demonstrate how we watched it at home for 10 years. And then there were a few texts. I would call them agitprop texts, as I explain actually within my film, and allegorical <coughs> riddles. It's a crazy story, which I've told a hundred times, but here it is again. This Faroqui retrospective was happening at our dear anthology film archive just down the street over there, Second Avenue. And he was there, and I walked up to him after the screening, and I asked if we could have breakfast together the next day. Yes, he said, good to his word. He showed up at my home. I offered him coffee and a toasted bagel with cream cheese. I remember every detail. He had never had a bagel before. See? And uh, I asked him if he would allow me to use some of, at that moment, some of uh, an extinguishable fire in a film of mine. He said yes. Um, I gave him a dollar. We all, all us young filmmakers knew that it, you had to exchange some money, it's very capitalism, uh, before a contract would be valid. So I wrote up a contract that said I give Joe Godwin the rights to use some of my film and her film in, rec in receipt of a dollar. I gave him a dollar and said goodbye. Soon enough I realized that what I wanted to do, that what had moved me to ask him for breakfast was I wanted his film to circulate. I was very angry that we hadn't seen any of his work, in particular this film, all those long war years. And beyond how it addressed Vietnam and all of that, I thought as a, as a, a proposition about a way to make cinema useful cinema. I use this word useful all the time because I'm writing a book called Useful Cinema. And finally, that's all I care about anymore is making films that are useful. In, in the important sense of the word, not like, we should know something about this, we should know something about that, which is, I would say, the address of most documentary films. Here's something you could know about welfare mothers. Here's something you could know about what's happening in Turkey today. You know, uh, useful is something else in my mind. And maybe it'll come out as I show these films, maybe not, but that's, that's kind of where I've come to at the end of a long career. Uh, so I thought this film, even though it was about a war that was now way done, uh, was much more useful than that, and I wanted it to circulate. And so finally my idea was to make a perfect replica of it in color. Why color? So that it didn't get mistaken for his black and white film. So that I didn't replace his film somehow, even though his film was not in circulation. But I was very anxious about people thinking I was usurping him or, you know, all that sort of stuff you worry about when you're a young filmmaker, not that young. Uh, uh, and in English, because uh, there was no English uh, version of it, no subtitled version. And these were American scientists and engineers and administrators and CEOs, and I thought we should be able to hear it in English. So that is what I did, and I called it seemed bizarre at the time, but this is what I wanted to do. I called it What Faroqui Taught, Why, to point to him as the author of the film, not myself, um, and uh, to point at what he taught, to say this, there's, there's things for us to learn here about filmmaking beyond what we can learn about Dow Chemical and Napalm and all that sort of stuff. So, it was an outrageous idea. I thought it would help get it in distribution. I always imagined people would say, who is this guy, Faroqui? No one had ever heard of him at the time. By the time I got the film made, people had, were beginning to hear about it. But um, it took seven years to get it made. Every year I applied to New York State Council on the Arts and the NEA, alternately applying to make a video and then the next year I'd apply to the film department to make a film. It got turned down straight for seven years. I always ask for the, and you should always ask for the panel's comments, which I could summarize, 
of seven years of them this way. Why would anybody make a film, a replica of a film that already exists? You know, <laughs> that just couldn't think beyond that, you know. If it already exists, then there's, there would be no reason to replicate it. So finally, um, I made, got it made using a student crew at the University of Notre Dame, where broke I had gone in the meantime to teach. And I got it made with a $5,000 grant from the Indiana Arts Council, the largest grant they'd ever made, a Citibank error in the amount of $3,497. Someone else's money had mistakenly been deposited in my checking account. It's true. I would not lie. A research grant from the Notre Dame Graduate School for $7,392 for student salaries $1,000 from the sale of Far From Poland to Taipei TV, and a $1,000 grant from an outfit, I don't know if they're still around, called Art Matters, Inc. Is that still there? I don't know. Uh, and this is how I became the queen of replicas. That's what I call myself. I've now made two replicas. Let me read just one thing before we watch the film, a quote from uh, Kutsia. Everybody know who that is? J.M. Kutsia, South African writer. Good. Uh, this was an article in the New York Review of Books, and the uh, reviewer quotes a book, uh, maybe it's an article by Kotsio called Into the Dark Chamber, The Writer in the South African State, 1986. Kotsio says he's kept alo aloof from direct liter literary activism. He speaks of novelists in South Africa being drawn to the torture room in search of novelistic fantasy. I think the same thing happens in documentary. Quote, direct quote, yet there is something tawdry about following the state in this way, making its vile mysteries the occasion of fantasy. For the writer, the deeper problem is not to allow himself to be impaled on the dilemma proposed by the state, either to ignore its obscenities, <coughs> excuse me, or to produce representations of them. The true challenge is how not to play the game by the rules of the state, how to establish one's own authority, how to imagine torture and death on one's own terms. When I read that, I thought that's what Faroki did. He didn't fall into the state's trap of saying, look how hard, look at these people burning down, the little girl running down the road, burning in the apartment. You've seen it a thousand times, we all go, <laughs> to not fall into that trap. So that's enough preface to my replica of what Faroki taught. Faroki made this film because somehow or another he got hold of Dow Chemical's annual report and there among, you know, the wall board and their latest, um, who knows what, court board or what else did they make? Millions of chemical products. Um, he noticed in that list, napa, better napalm. And it went on to list, the, you know, they were this far along with this and that far along with that, and it was stunning to him to see napalm listed among um, insecticides and uh, better, uh, boy, my brain's dead, but you know what I mean. And that's what actually made him think there's a way to talk about war and there's a way to talk about napalm in those terms and not in, you know, by driving to Midland, Michigan, catching the CEO of Dow in the parking lot as he got out of his car, you know, grilling him with questions about, do you know how many people you're killing? You know, that, that sort of traditional way of being angry at this and that. Um, the refusal to subscribe to the myth of unintelligibility. Napalm can be explained. It's not something that us poor, normal human beings can't understand, can't figure out. And he shows us, some, again, uh, sort of uh, what I like to call demonstrations. You know, how, how it is that a product like that gets approved how they go to this department and that department and ask for this and for that, and how happy, in fact, I like this part of his writing, that the uh, 
the chemists who were asked, do you have anything that could make it stick to humans? Yeah, we've got this thing we're using for rubber sole. What else are you looking for? You know, this, which is natural in some way. You know, this is, you can imagine the community of Dow Chemical responding to this, you know. There's this nice looking project director who's coming around saying, we're still looking for this, we're still looking for that. You got anything like that? You can, you can actually hear how it all happens. Um, no absolution in the film, no place in the film to weep, which is what's a common stock of, of a lot of documentaries. That we, are, we are brought to a kind of an emotional pathos, a chance to use our empathy for other human beings, whatever, whatever, whatever. It doesn't trade in empathy. You know, to James Baldwin, so it was the biggest problem in cinema was the exploitation of empathy, audience empathy. And he doesn't use this language, but when I teach documentary, I talk, always talk about the address of a film. Who does the address say you are who's watching the film? And I make my students figure that out every time I show them a film. And the address is always, especially in what I would call national, Nonfiction. You Americans, you civic minded, interested in the welfare of others, <coughs> Americans, you should know about this, right? The documentaries operate in the realm of you should know about this if you're going to be a capable citizen. And that's how we're addressed. He's not addressing, he's addressing us like, um, like what? I hadn't ever thought about this before people who have to understand how this war shit gets made, right? Well, this is how it works. You, know, you do this, and then you do this, you go to the library, you look up napalm, you study the, you know, figure it out. His, I've mentioned this before, his, the generosity of the film. This is a German filmmaker who didn't need to make a film about napalm and Vietnam and all that, who, who did because in fact, what he's making a film about is much bigger than even Vietnam and napalm. It's really like I think about labor. Um, they're cheap filmmaking. Um, it avoids ethical issues with what, what I call social actors. Those are people that live in the world who we ask to be in our films and stand in for this and stand in for that. And, He's always, he's always making models of things. Like it's a really good idea about how to operate to make models. Um, the replica, I talked about why I, why I did it, to distribute it, basically. My idea was filmmaking as distribution. I didn't want to try and go into distribution of a 25-year-old black and white German film about a war that was long over. That was not something that was appealing to me, but I thought I could distribute his film in some way by this kind of bold, unheard of replica idea and by what I called it. So uh, also to study it myself when you, you know, like painters who go to the pro, any museum, the Louvre, and, and paint again a Vermeer or paint again a whatever, you learn how to paint somehow. You, um, for pedagogical reasons, to have it to teach, um, also to train students, but 15 students of mine worked on it with me. Um, and to not let mourning Vietnam keep going on, instead to look it in the eye in the clear light of mourning and get out of this mourning phase we were in, which is still not resolved. I don't know if you know this, but the United States is spending about $20 million as we speak, making, putting together a 10-year project where we will, where we will um, somehow close the chapter on Vietnam, celebrate our soldiers, you know, acknowledge nothing but, you know, <laughs> I work with a group of uh, veterans called Veterans for Peace, and, and uh, we've had a project going for about four years called, um, I can't remember the name of it, but we've been trying to get 
the truth about Vietnam out to people. And we had a meeting last night where we talked about how we can, Ken Burns is also, as part of this, making the six hour Vietnam <laughs> film. And we all know what that's going to look like. And uh, full disclosure is the name of the Veterans for Peace project to, to somehow put out there a full disclosure of what happened in Vietnam. And, uh, and uh, so it's, they, they have to close it off. It makes perfect sense that now, safely, how many years later, 73 was the Paris peace talks, right? But it's still hanging around like an unresolved issue. So now we're going to officially shut it down, put it into memory, be done with it. And in some way, throw so a piece of Go on to the next one. Go on to the next one, right. So, um, so when, I, when the, I, I talk about this film, another film, Faroqui's film, there are many others. Uh, as post-realists, what I'm, I'm really talking about a hundred things, but I think most important is uh, to get out of the pornography, one, um, to make a useful film that actually teaches how to understand something instead of just um, produces a film that addresses us in a certain way. What's the address of Faroqui's film? Who is it to? Who does he say we are when he makes that film, Inextinguishable Fire, which I remake? People who might stop a war, right? Not by picketing or protesting, but by thinking through how war is made. And in fact, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of work done at Dow Chemical uh, in fact, I, I, I found a book actually when I first got to Notre Dame somehow in the library about studies that were made about who of their employees were most likely to turn against Dow Chemical because of what they were making. There, was a, there were tickets that that whole scene with the, the chemist who goes out and finds the leaflet from the Harvard students on her car stop. So, so there, here was this whole sociological study about which scientists were most likely to leave Dow um, and which weren't. And uh, in fact, the ones who were top in their field commanded a high salary were the ones who were most uh, likely to leave. The lower paid workers were the most likely to stay because they couldn't move. So anyway, so, so that's what he's up to. So post realists the bottom line for me is useful. Is it a useful film? Does it teach us what, uh, what we need to know so that we can act uh, intelligently on our own behalf and on the behalf of the country? So we'll leave, uh, well actually, you know, we can do with some questions and answers. If there are any. Yeah. I'm curious about the acting or lack of acting, like the just flat affect yeah. I call it affectless. Um, Breck uses it a lot. It doesn't come from nowhere. But especially, I think, in this film where he's really using people as, as I, I like this idea, stand-ins for real people, the Germans as well. And in fact, in Faroqui's film, they, it was also this affect, like, aff, aff, affectless acting. Um, so that it's not about, I mean, he, you know, one could run to the middle of Michigan and find a chemist who would be who would agree to act, tell about whatever on camera, and stand there and say, "Why are these Harvard students writing me this? I make wonderful herbicides, you know, whatever." Um, to to get out of that and to just hear the speech and see what kind of interactions there might be, I think the affect this choice is the right choice for that. He's not interested in involving us in a drama and affected speech, which is typical in, in the cinema, involves us with the human being as if we had a real intimate relationship with that person because they're weeping now or something like that. So the affectless 
frees us to just observe, to understand that there are chemists, men and women, who are in this kind of situation, you know, and to listen to the, what's spoken. So, uh, in fact, when I, I asked, I, I had a dialogue with him through the whole making of the film because there were a thousand things I didn't know what to, how to do. How do you kill the flies? How do you get a plant to collapse right in front of your eyes? I know, <laughs> I know the answers to these all now, but I didn't then. And he sort of, re this was a long time after he'd made the film, he sort of remembered some of it. But um, there was one print which had English subtitles and. Uh, and it was like the voices were a little out of sync. And I asked if that was technical problems. No, he had moved the soundtrack out, slightly out of sync because he didn't even want, you know, the classic thing of the cinema where somebody speaks and the, and the speech comes in perfect sync out of their mouths, you know. So he even offset, and I did as well a little, um, the speech from the performance. So I like it, you know. I don't think it's. I don't think you have to do it, but I think if you're trying to do what he was trying to do, it's very, very, very effective. Yeah. Um, and, and you know that affect listeners, um, especially like one of the credit the collage credits. This is Dow Chemical, the glued on humanism, yeah. which so is you know they're precisely they're, it's like invasion of the body centers. They're, they're they're just kind of going through. And it's, uh, you know, alienated isn't even a word, right? Alienated labor, but they're alienated from any normality, any kind of human relations. And in fact, it seems like Fruki closes off the possibility of stopping the war at the factory. When the woman who picks up the flyers, she sort of rationalizes, well, we provide, you know, what, what about all the good things that the not kind of and the, the engineer, I think he says something like, it, it's up to the, the workers, the students, oh. and the engineers. And the little riddle at the end. What we yeah. make in factories depends, is that, he says, and, and the engineers? Workers, students, and engineers? And engineers, yeah. Um, what do you, I, yeah, I'm trying to still process how to think about that, because he, you know, is it within. He's, he's saying we can't, we can't participate in the making of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Dow gets the contract. You know, the sh shareholders get all the money. And mm -hmm. Look at the sale to Saudi Arabia, $110 billion or something like that. Today, yesterday, tomorrow. That's, that's who's running these wars, you know. So he, but he's saying we can't stop that. But we cannot make this stuff. Right. And that's, that's a metaphor for a much bigger scale of production beyond just, you know, chemical companies global, you know, international chemical companies, uh, which do make all this stuff, but it's just a, me a metaphor for, <coughs> it has to be stopped some other way. And he's using the metaphor of actually producing the materials. But it's, point it's interesting that you point to those sets. This, I think that, uh, I don't have a word for it, the artificiality of the sets, the secretary with the red Dow chemical, mm sign over her desk, you know, all of that. He's, it, it's post-realist. He's not interested in the realism of what a real uh, boardroom of a company like Dow Chemical would look like. He's, that's actually his living room. And uh, they actually cut that wall, that hole in the wall, that window, so that they could do these dolly shots from the secretary into, um, so all of that, <coughs> Again, he's not asking you to participate in the cinema on the level of, you know, being lost in the real s system of the cinema, mm -hmm. but to, again, be back and look at the construction. Mm -hmm. It's like a salon scene, you know, type of third world cinema, the, the boom mic comes into the frame. And no, you, you didn't see any it. boom mic in that film. <laughs> this is real. <laughs> You could focus on the content, but I wonder about it as a useful film. Do you think he is talking about individual choices or collective action or evolving? I think thoughts? he is talking primarily about individual choices. Um, again, the address is to the individual and not to a self defined collectivity of 
scientists or you know, it's bigger or work or general workers. You know, it's really, I mean, it really hit me hard when I when I I was teaching when I finally got to make this film, and I thought, well, my God, my labor, which produces Alan, who <laughs> happened to be a student of mine, or Rebecca, um, gets put together with other teachers' labor, and I have to teach better to make sure that my labor is active in that student, you know, and I have to be part of the, you know, faculty senate and struggle with all that stuff, which right now is going down real bad. You know? I mean, it's really bad stuff happening in universities. We could go off on that forever. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a address to conscience um, and to be wary. Yeah. Yeah, I guess any um, art making is a little personal. And I was wondering in your conversation, in your practice with them, um, no. if you addressed, because it's identical, uh, what happened to Farber in Germany in 69, it was still that um, very close to Zagwai. Many of the big Nazis were still in power positions. And a uh, big chemical company, Farber, obviously. Bayer so, aspirin, same thing. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, they're heavily involved in uh, producing the uh, yeah. gas that was just in Cyclone, Cyclone B, yeah. And um, I was wondering how, yeah, if you discuss this. this personal story, how it is, and how something can be very personal and still have a universal message. You mean his mo motives in making the film? Um, yeah. Or was it mostly when you spoke to him? Was it in front of, from his personal German history? No, uh, we didn't have that conversation, but um, you know, he was the editor of Film Critic magazine. He, by the time I was running into his work, and I had read him, and I knew what his politics were, so, um, and they seemed clear to me when I saw his film. But I'm not answering your question. No, we didn't have talks about what was happening in Germany. And listen, our entire space program was basically produced by. <laughs> Yeah. German engineer, yeah. aeronautical engineers that we got out of here, Nazis, who, you know, had been bombing England to death, um, and then came over. What, no, what I just thought when I thought that his motivation was not to show Bayer or Farber, uh -huh. but show Darwin. Uh -huh. Was he avoiding so the situation in Germany? I see what you're saying. Yeah, I didn't, I never asked him that, you know, I didn't ask him that. But I don't think so because he's just made so many films that take up German, German situations that I, I don't think that's how he operates. You know. This was his second film. He made one very, very short film called Message to the Chairman. And uh, anybody seen it? Oh, paper Airplane. Paper Airplane, yeah. <laughs> to Chairman Mao, actually. And I can't remember what it said, but this is, uh, you know, this is, he's still a student before he gets kicked out with all the other kind of radical filmmakers of the German Film Academy. Um, uh, and as, this, as he tells the story, he, he saw this Dow Chemical annual report and it hit him that um, there was something bizarre about how casually Dow could advertise or tell its shareholders, I guess you can't call it advertising. Uh, what their successes were, what they were working on, as if there was nothing else to say about them. You know. But well, I don't. Don't you think he was? Uh, I think that he, he, being in Germany at that time, he knew that that it's a very it's a different way of approaching what he what was going on in Germany, where people were kind of reading their hands about the Holocaust, but at the same time, collecting their salaries at Bayer and uh, like all the different corporations. 
Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it was, it's a very uh, clever way of, of not directly confronting that. Yeah, it was one of the to make it from a specific because everybody else caused a shock. Holocaust, it was horrible. But, and everybody's shocked to think about Vietnam too, but to make it a little bit less. To make it more, yeah. Well, he you know, strikes me as an anti imperialist. So the U.S. Yeah. current war machine, you know, I mean, he did um, War at a Distance. I remember yep. I was like looking up his PS when I saw that, and that was very, it's today, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he did it on a yeah. I think you know how films, how films come through your mind, and when you go, I want to do that, you know. I mean, I, I can't account for that moment for him, but I think, I like this story of the Dow Chemical Annual Report somehow, as it made him go, holy shit, you could take this stuff and make a film out of it. And, and not as a, so I don't have to make a film about which Nazis are still left running Bayer or running Farber or whatever. I don't know. That's how, that's how I end up making films. <laughs> Semi-accidental, actually, the way I make films is when I have an idea about how you could make a film that did this, you know, and I saw Faroki's film as an idea about how you could make a film about labor and chemical companies and all that, and that's how I think about what I'm going to make, and I don't think enough people think about that. Do I have an idea about how that could be told how they could be demonstrated, how, you know, what, what would be, and I didn't think that way until I got stuck in this dilemma with Far From Poland where I couldn't go do what I always knew to do, get a crew together, go to Poland, go watch, you know, people speak for the first time outside of, you know, that talk that everybody had been talking, you know. I stumbled in there and then had to invent this crazy film um, which cut me loose from documentary as we know it. But, and then I see Faroki's film and I go, shit, you can actually decide to do that. And it will look different every time. I'm not saying everybody's film should look like an inextinguishable fire. But it's a way to think about why and how to make cinema. So it's, in some way it's my answer to you. I think that's what happened to him. You said it was accidental? Not accidental, but he said, shit, it's all right there in Dow Chemicals annual report. I just have to take that and figure out how to stage that intelligence. And I, I mean, I'm also asking because I know there was a book written a couple of years before this film came out, which was really identical to the story not told about uh, Barbara. Barbara. Don't, I really can't answer it. We didn't have that. Most of our conversation was about how do you get the flies to die. <laughs> <laughs> What, what kind of plane did you use and you know, where did you get that footage? I actually found every shot in that sequence of newsreel, but one. Um, actually found it in various archives of, you know, Vietnam footage of the two little uh, Asian looking a boy and a girl. And I actually asked the owner of a Chinese restaurant in South Bend, Indiana, if I could borrow his young son and daughter and shoot, shoot that shot. It's on for about eight, eight seconds, 10 seconds. It's the only shot I didn't find, but I went out of my way to actually really replicate his film in every way. And I got very lucky uh, to find that huge tumbler where there's a guy in black with a gas mask on, which is exactly the same gas mask he had. There was one left in 1996 in the United States, and it was like 40 miles from South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> and we were able to get the camera up high enough, as it was in uh, Faroki's film, to shoot that thing. But that's where they mix chemicals. And this was a <coughs> perfume uh, company that was 
in charge of, of adding perfumes to various household products. Um, and that's why that factory was still in operation. That's how you mix those scents together. And, we, and they were very nice and they said, sure, you can come in and shoot. You know. So um, anyway, anything else before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, I just, um, the, this maybe um, need <laughs> someone to make a bill about there's a factory in Woodstock, which I have a house in Willow near this part of Woodstock, and there's a factory there. It's the largest factory in Woodstock, and Woodstock has a peace sign in the middle of the town square, and it's known as the uh, land of peace and harmony and music and flowers, and, um, and they, it, it employs 600 people, and it's by far the largest employee in town. And they make fans. They started out making little fans for, you know, cool off or household use or for refrigerators. And uh, now that those fans are what they call their commercial side. Their real business in the United States is making fans that are in all the weapons. And they're like, it's an essential ingredient yeah. in any guided missile or um, any thing that's going to explode and <laughs> our drone or whatever. And we tried, a group of us, you know, in terms of electric move, we tried to, you know, at the time, my only thought was to document the meeting. We had a big meeting. We had a conference that lasted two days, and we invited peace people up to the organization to leave and whatever to talk about it. And we got thinking that we would inform the people in Woodstock that this was happening under their eyes. Or, but they all worked it. Yep. And, and we were met with total hostility. But it's interesting that you could have figured out a way to talk to the workers, probably, that might have been more productive than just a meeting with them, presenting your outre ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know what it is, but I'm just thinking that. I mean, I think what is the position of some people in the room actually making sense it's a love, and then you find that out, and you have to figure out. You still have to forget it. Most of the, so some of the workers didn't know their. But it fills somebody else's can, so it's very. There's only so many bed and breakfasts you can run and stuff. Yeah. What? There's only so many bed and breakfasts. But did the workers not know that where these fans were going? They didn't know. That they, they were so some did, some did. The IDF, um. So do you think for the sake of time we should go to the... Yeah. Because yeah. I want to spend time on that. Somewhere. Okay. I just have one more thought that he does represent, you know, in the little, what I call the riddle at the end, the three, the worker, the student, and the engineer. Both the, the worker and the student take I love the idea to take a part home every day because the wife yeah. wants a vacuum cleaner. And it turns out to be an automatic weapon, which, by the way, we were able to rent very cheaply in South mm -hmm. Bend, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking scared the shit out of me. <laughs> anyway, uh, Rebecca's right, we should go on. Scum, right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try and. Wait, do we have a time limit? Um, or just. For, for tip. The introduction? No. Or Do we have to be out of here by no, 10 o'clock? No. All right. So I spent about three or four years working with uh, Ernie Larson and Sherry Milner on a collection of films, which eventually came to be a, a four volume DVD collection uh, called Disruptive Film Everyday Resistance to Power. They had programmed the um, I think eight evenings of screenings at the Oberhausen Film Festival, which is the most important short film festival in the world. Now there are probably a hundred more. <laughs> um, they were asked to curate uh, 
six or seven evenings. They spent about three years collecting films from all over the world, short, nonfiction, political films. And uh, it was a big succé fou, as they said, the French say, in Oberhausen. And then I was a friend, and I would come back from teaching at Notre Dame, and they'd start to show these things to me. And I was astounded, because these films were essentially out, not in distribution. They just flow right by television, and they flow right by, partly because they're short, but also partly because of their content. And the collection was astounding. And in fact, volume one is out already, and volume, volume two just went to press, and I think it's even better. In fact, far from uh, what Froki taught is in volume two, if you're interested in having your very own copy. Um, but one of the films they showed me, I was the one who said to them, we've got to put these in distribution, because they just float, float around. I mean, films from Bolivia, from China, from Chiapas, from France, obviously, from the United States, from Poland, from Russia. Just work that somehow gets made independently, some of it rather brilliant, and for the most part, post what I would call post-realist. So I was pretty excited. And uh, one of them was a French film made in 1976 by uh, a French filmmaker, Carol Rosopoulos, and a very famous fil French film actress, Delphine Sering, called Scum Manifesto. Does everybody know what the Scum Manifesto is? You do, I know. This was a off the wall, radical, beyond radical, text which Valerie Solanas wrote and, and printed on, on a mimeograph machine and sold on the streets of New York for a little bit of time, trying to get it published. Um, six months later, she shot Andy Warhol. She's the woman who shot Andy Warhol, which is her basic handle these days. Um, but eventually the, the uh, text was published has been on and off all these years and is now in 20 different uh, languages. It's well circulated, mostly by feminists. It's a feminist tract. She would not call herself a feminist and you'll see why, but um, I uh, identify as a feminist tract. So these two French people, uh, in 1976, the text was banned in France and they had this idea to make a film um, where, well, what happens in the film is Duffing Serig has translated the English text into French and piece by piece is speaking it out loud and across the table is, in fact, the other filmmaker who's typing it line by line by line. And the net effect is it slows the text down. I, mean, I, I read the thing. In the early 70s, I think, I thought it was uproarious, great, oh, so over the top, it was thrilling to read, but one read it like for pleasure. What happens when you see the French film, which is not in distribution in English, not, it's available only as far as I know in France, um, is it's slowed down by this device of translating it and typing it. So you have to think about what's being spoken. It loses this pleasure game, you know. I don't think, I know for sure that Valerie Solanas did not, was not making entertainment. It's a deadly serious piece of work. She was deadly serious about everything she did, including shooting Andy Warhol. She was very angry at him because um, he had promised to publish a play of hers and then never did and then said he lost the play and blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, so when Ernie and Sherry showed it to me, I said, yes, it goes into disruptive film. And then we couldn't clear the rights. So in fact, it isn't and won't ever be in this collection of films it belongs in. And uh, it's, it's a very complicated story um, because I wrote a very critical piece which got put on IndieWire about Joshua Oppenheim's <laughs> the act of killing uh, and kind of went so-called viral 
who went to all kinds of countries, and a woman, a cinematographer in Poland, read it, looked me up, discovered I'd made a film in 1984 about the Solidarity Movement, asked a friend of hers who was in New York on a Fulbright to see if she could find the film. She found it in the New York Public Library, that's what libraries are for, liked it very much, got in touch with me, looked at all my other work, went back to Poland and organized a full retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. So that gets me to Poland. <laughs> and, uh, and later she's back in New York. I show her the Scum Manifesto and I tell her that we can't publish it basically. And somehow as I'm telling it to her, I have this idea we should make a version in Polish, skip around the copyright problems. I don't actually know legally if we've done that or not, but the French <laughs> audio-visual collection that owns the rights to it is not punishing us. They know about my film. And so I go back to Poland, and, and with the help of Joanna Krakowska, my co-director, who found the actresses and all that, we set this very simple, it's a single take. You'll see a couple cups, cuts in my version, but it's basically a single take in the original. 27 minutes long of selected paragraphs from the Scum Manifesto. And um, so here it is, that's the story. That's how things are when you make a film and it gets out into the world and then something happens and somebody reads about it and someone brings you to Poland and you meet some nice people there. <laughs> and suddenly you're making your second replica, which is why I call myself the queen of replicas. I don't know if anyone else has ever made two replicas, but uh, I'm stopping now. I just wouldn't you know. I had already said no more films when I left uh, teaching at, at the University of Notre Dame, but somehow here's this other film. So maybe that's enough. But um, I always like to start it with the very, reciting the very first sentence, because it's so good. <laughs> it feels good to do it. Life in, Bo, uh, Boana, Solanus wrote, life in this society being at best an utter bore, and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women. There remains the civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking thrill women. I love those three adjectives next to each other civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and destroy the male sex. So that's how it all begins. Now we will watch. She organizes the idea of um, uh, the male desire to um, perpetuate work digging holes and filling them up. I love that idea. <laughs> As a kind of um, useless activity that makes them important and avoid their own loneliness. And it's a completely radical idea, but there's something in it that holds a lot of water for me. And uh, it's one of the reasons it seemed worth perpetuating. Uh, it's much longer, it's about 70 times longer than that, the actual text. And the French just shows these paragraphs. It's actually the beginning of the thing. But there's something in there about uh, what the male needs to feel complete and comfortable and intimate, not really, and what he projects. I think that's also some of the most important stuff, how he projects the woman as, as seeking um, uh, some kind of satisfaction, projecting on them that, uh, that the female is satisfied by child raising. <laughs> and um, what's the other thing? Is it? Child raising and, and, and their own sexuality somehow, which I think is uh, a gross distortion, but very close to something. Um, that maintains the balance of power, at least in capitalist society. Um, and so there, there are holes there, like holes in the theater of us and now and where we are that are productive uh, windows to go through for a second. And that's, 
I think, but now I want to hear from you people. At first, I was in like a state of shock. Um, it's just... That she, anybody would say it's that. It's a very powerful film. You don't really expect to hear something like this, but then it was really fun to watch in a group because you see in the first couple minutes there was a lot more laughter. Yeah. So that as the film kind of progressed, you don't yeah. laugh anymore and yeah. you kind of realize like yeah. this isn't satire. Because it's and then also like laughter is a way of like to get around the awkwardness of how destroy radical. it's destroy really destroy the male destroy the male sex. I would say this is more radical than Mark ever was. Yeah. I mean to go this is going against like the core of so much that it, I don't even know what to say at this point. Like I need to like read the text, like read about it and come back to you in a couple of years, some scholarship in and say like, okay, yeah. here we go. Get a handle on it. There's a great, great article by, uh, uh, I'm gonna forget her name. If anybody's interested, just email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, it's, there's a brand new edition of the Scum Manifesto by Verso now her name's Roxanne or something, and I'm blocking it out now, which helps a lot with it. How it fits in the feminist writing of the time and uh, how it goes past that. Mm -hmm. It does, it goes past everything you've ever read, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, that's the astonishment of it, that she goes right beyond, we need equal pay for equal work. I mean, everything, <laughs> everything we think of as what we need, she's operating, you know, way past that. So that's the excitement, the thrill somehow, of listening to her slowly, not just, as, as I said, when I first read it, I thought it was, wow, this is fantastic, it's over the top. I didn't take it seriously as a text. Somehow, watching these, phrases come out, something else happens. You have you get to try it on. And you can go, oh not all men and you can do you can push away some of it. But finally it's a systematic thinking about uh, what the male has done, why women are sad. I love the list of what women do to keep yeah. themselves <laughs> amused. <laughs> you know, popping pills, <laughs> art films. <laughs> the art film bit was very... Yeah, very I mean, that's when you know that she's actually quite brilliant, yeah. you know, when she can make a list like that. Well, actually, the first list, you know, what is it, how does it go? Um, you know, the, in the very first sentence. Life, life, life being completely irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. Responsible, civic-minded, civic minded, thrill-seeking women. I mean, who puts those three things together? <laughs> That's a radical moment, an empowering moment of, of anything I've ever read in a feminist tradition. That is so fucking useful. It's just really useful. Oh, so yeah. you just, what? You should be civic-minded and thrill-seeking. At, we yeah. should be, <laughs> but we forget the thrill well, seeking. Think about you know? it. Wait, I don't and the idea fun. that revolution, yeah. that kind of revolution, yeah. eliminate the money system, yeah. could be a thrill. Yeah. She puts that, you know, yeah. that, that there could be pleasure, I guess would be another way of saying it, from correcting that, you know, attacking it, undoing it. It's way out there, but it's, it's an idea that I have not heard articulated in my 74 years of living on the left, blah, 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 blah. So that's one of the reasons, or one of the many reasons that we said, let's, let's put this out again and see if we can get other people to put it out and keep it moving. You know, it's not going to go away. I mean, if Verso is putting out a new edition of it, they're not idiots in terms of uh, distribution and sales and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, well, that was the reception of Poland. Very, very good. Uh, you know, I mean, in certain circles, <laughs> yeah. the people who hang around me and Joanna uh, Krakowska, who, who's a very famous uh, theater historian who works a lot in the United States on uh, living theater and that sort of stuff, but extremely well pres you know, respected and deep in feminist circles and all that. So basically, that's who's coming. Um, I don't know what would happen in a general audience with this film. I think they'd just walk out, you know. <laughs> I mean, because it's so over the top. It is, 
it's not it's really very useful the text but it is at the same time so far beyond anything articulated without being anti-male or anything like that it's just a way of opening yeah. some shit up yeah. <laughs> I, I i started to read it about 40 years ago <laughs> Yeah, you know, right around the it's time. only this big, by the way. I mean, it was a pamphlet. Yeah, I mean, uh, Avital, Avital Avital Runnell Avital. is, uh, by the way, is the name of this. Uh, I think very good writer on. There's been a lot of good writing on it, but this this essay knocked me out, helped me a lot with what's going on here, and where it was. Uh, uh, Cote de, <laughs> couldn't think of the English, but there's the French. Feminist writing of the time and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I didn't know how to take it. Yeah. I, I stopped. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I think the film form is, is useful, you know, yeah. because it has time. And I, it, you, you realize that when you read, you read for a kind of pleasure. And if it's not coming fast, of it, fast enough, you read faster, you know, or you skip to the next chapter, or you only read the section, you know, we have all kinds of mechanisms for finding our pleasure. And when I use the word pleasure, I mean satisfaction really in reading that if you've agreed to sit and spend 27 minutes with a piece of film, you know, you might be more patient and eventually you might let some of it make some, some kind of sense to you. So. I have like a, like a smaller question. The typist in like the middle of it, stops typing and lights a cigarette and just embraces the she, moment. She Is there like a reason? She does that? in the French film too. Yeah. Do you I know don't why know what their happened? reason okay. was. The thing is she stopped, she forgot to stop typing. And then the uh, Dolphin Sarah characters yeah. give her this like look, you know, <laughs> which is a little confusing, I think. Yeah. But um, we had all these cues worked yeah. out. Turn on, turn the volume up after this, yeah. and we had placed. And it. was the uh, the water drinking cued? Or was that no uh, herself? Okay. What about so. the, uh, the the videos? I mean, did they we spent a lot of time. I think they're more relevant for polls and yeah. recognize a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we decided that would be the criteria. Um, you know, at six months after this retrospective, mine at which I was awarded by the president of Poland. A, uh, a knighted by the president of Poland for having made Far From Poland. Can you believe that? <laughs> didn't, didn't see it coming. Six months later, he was out, Komorowski, and this new right-wing uh, Truth and Justice Party was in, um, and uh, things have not gone well. First thing, almost the first thing they announced was defunding the arts. It's interesting. Because the museum in Warsaw, the Museum of Modern Art, had agreed, we'd signed all the papers to buy the Polish rights to Far From Poland. And then they had the right man this sad later saying, we can't do it, we didn't get our acquisition money. The last second, just at the end of the fiscal year, somehow they let the money go through and they did buy it. But um, uh, it's because actually during all those 80 through to 89, when the wall went down, Filmmakers in Poland were not making films about it all. So my film shot in New York City and the Poconos, you know, coal mine in, in Western Pennsylvania and, and Princeton University Gardens, the various sets of Far From Poland, ends up being the most complete document <laughs> of the solidarity movement. And also the text, you know, there are four major texts in the film that I reenacted with some pretty great performers. And um, uh, so that's why I was knighted for, it's, it's a special knighthood for non-Poles who make a major contribution to Polish culture or something like that. It's not your average knighthood, but anyway, <laughs> I, should have brought, I should have brought it, but I forgot. Um, so it's because this film is actually, I mean, young people who weren't there, you know, in the next generation who wasn't watching it. Uh, you know, we showed it at a couple of high schools who were wrapped because they don't know their own history any more than my students at Notre Dame in 1991 knew, knew what Vietnam was about, even though their uncles and their fathers had fought in it, who refused to talk about it, of course. Um, it's just, 
you know, it slips away. When, when Guzman showed the Battle of Chile yeah. to Chilean students, they were in tears. They were in tears, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They had no idea. Yeah, I know. We don't, history, nobody teaches it. Um, how do you differentiate post-realism from surrealism? <laughs> or is there really much of a difference? Never thought of it. I mean, it, it, it means something special to me, which is really, uh, it's really writing. I mean, and choices you make that are not cinema choices that just operate the way, you know, we've had nonfiction and fiction. And, one is about desires, I wish I was that rich, I wish I was that beautiful, I wish my life was that tragic and then that fulfilled in this regular cinema and in documentary, which takes this, always, Bill Nichols wrote this, a book a long time ago, a stance, a particular stance of being useful and part of civic experience to be a useful citizen and has a few tricks, you know, um, Empathy being the biggest one, you know. Uh, that's why there aren't that many films made about very, very rich people. <laughs> there was a period back there in the 80s where suddenly people were making films about art collectors. And, I mean, it's still, it's around a bit, much more than it used to be. But for the most part, it takes up one idea and one idea only. You should know this. And that's why you're watching this film, because you should know this. You implied is to be a useful citizen. You should know about, about this, right? And that's what the stance that all nonfiction takes, right? And it falls into a, you know, a very worn out, which is, I think, why I don't go see any regular new documentaries anymore. Um, but the great documentaries, um, Winwell is the post-realist, Land Without Bread, if you haven't seen it, that's the place to start thinking about post-realist. He's shooting in Spain and he's in that village and that village and that village, but he's proposing, <laughs> there's an analysis of capitalism, there's um, a preposterousness, uh, of um, and just everything about the film is it's realism used to push past classic notions of what's worth knowing and what's worth living and how those systems hide and preclude and dissemble about really what does it mean to have a town that doesn't have any bread next to the University of Salamanca, which is the oldest university in Europe? Right? So that's where it starts for me. But there are, I, I didn't invent these films. And nor did Jerry and Ernie. We just, they just collected them from all over the world. They're, they're films that have an idea about how we should know and how we should understand something, not the evidence. Um, the pseudo kind of evidence that produces no, what I call knowingness. Not knowledge, but knowingness. I think most documentaries offer audiences something that you could call, I'm in the know about that, or knowingness, not useful knowledge. I think Faroki's film produces useful knowledge, and I think in some way the French authors of that 1986 film simpler idea, God knows. Let's just read it and type it up, and one, we'll get around the censorship, and two, we'll get to think about it. It's just two things. There's only three things happening in the film. Somebody reads, somebody types, and every now and then we watch some footage, which is, as a, I think I would argue, more useful for Polish people than for us particularly, but it's all right-wing stuff. Um, that demonstration, which was a, a celebration of Polish, independence turned into, well, if you can imagine, enormous size, first of all. And it, it sort of released the thugs out, just the way Trump is doing now, um, in our counter -dem demonstrations, in our um, 
whatever, hate crimes. You know, this was, it was big time in Poland, and uh, and even the the party, the Truth and Justice Party, had to kind of try and pull him back. And that last sequence is about private armies, uh, young people in this city and that city agreeing to spend their weekends in some kind of uniform which they pay for themselves to protect. I think one girl says it at one point, my city, my friends, well, when you hear private army, you just go, whoa, we are close to something. But they have um, worked up an anti-immigrant, anti-everything thing going on there. And they've been very smart, it's much smarter than Mr. Trump, like giving a lot of money to families that have more than one child, a lot of money, like a big paycheck every month. Uh, so they're working it in a much smarter way, but they have the Polish workers and the Polish farmers and peasants buying into this Truth and Justice Party while they rip all the social, uh, I don't know what they call it, all the other stuff apart, defunding art, defunding uh, scholarship, academia, all this sort of thing and giving money to these private armies. And the U.S. is, while we were shooting, the U.S. was sh doing war games on the border of Poland and Russia. Um, when, when was this made? We shot in uh, 15, 2015, two years ago. Uh, Obama had come over. Yeah. And well, the, they're, they're doing it now. Too. Yeah, I mean, it's just part of the whole thing we're about to watch. But um, it was scary stuff on television. What to show exactly, I left it to Joanna to make those choices pretty much. Mm -hmm. And when to turn the sound up. And um, yeah, I, I really love this film also because of the reason you said, like it, I feel like if I'm reading it, um, or if I'm even hearing it out loud without the visuals, yeah. I, I feel like it's a text that's very easy to dismiss. And or like, laugh at. Or laugh at. Oh, that has nothing to do with me. Right. That's when we laugh, right? Oh, oh that's so crazy. Yeah. yeah. And just to think, like, oh, Valerie's Long, this is probably crazy. But when you yeah. see it, like, spoken by, you know, two people who are actually in the classroom each other, I feel like it gets, like, digested and it starts to really sink in and make sense. Yeah. And it doesn't sound crazy at all. Yeah. And, um, and I was wondering, because after we saw the French, film in your class, yeah. loved it so much, and I was like, somebody should make a, a remake. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, um, and then you made it. And then I made it. <laughs> you made it before, so you were like right after. But I'm, I'm also wondering, like. Part of it is, is that the, uh, the woman doing the translating is angry, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. she's spitting that stuff out much more so than in the French. Yeah. Just yes. how she yes. performed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and she, she throws in the periods. And yeah, commas, well, that's, you know? in, that's in the French. Every comma, oh, every every yeah. semicolon, yeah. every period. She yeah. picks up a bit, a bit of Polish, yeah. like knowing yeah. like what. Yeah. <laughs> she spits it out. But there's nothing to do except, you know, let yourself find it fascinating that somebody would have written that and that it's worth repeating and all that. There's they're just two women reading and typing. I mean, there's nothing to be upset about, you know. Right. And you can get up and say, fuck this, I don't want to watch it. But if you don't, they're serious about what they're doing. Yeah. That's, that's implicit in the film is that somebody is translating a text and somebody is typing it up for obvious reasons. Um, and you recognize, and it's straight talk, She's not pulling any punches. She's not a sociologist. She's not a psychologist. She's not a geologist. She's just telling this stuff that Valerie wrote, you know, and you can either listen to it, try it on, or not. That's, so the terms are, it's not, because it's not a movie as we know it, needing us to love it, right? Wanting us to be, amazed by it, all the things that the cinema does, right? It's tremendous, powerful medium. Eyes and ears, that's all you just got to give it over and it'll take you somewhere 
and it'll be a thrill ride of some sort, thrill ride of envy or a thrill ride of, you know, horror or something like that. But because they just keep doing it and they don't care about you in some way and the film doesn't care about what you think of them, something else is possible. And I have got a name for that thing because I never saw it before I saw this film. I've never seen a film like this that in some way just did what it was doing and it wasn't about my pleasure or my education or anything like that. The device of translating it and typing it, irrespective of us, somebody set a camera out, but other than that, we're not, there's no con going on. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. She's reading, translating, and she's typing. And every now and then we watch some TV, you know. So it's something in there that makes uh, some kind of comprehension and some useful moments possible because the film doesn't address us in the way I was talking before that films always send out an address like who you are, what you know, who, what you care about, where you've been, what you know. That's part of the address and in documentary it's almost always the same address. But this film doesn't have any address to its audience. It just says, watch and listen while they do this thing that they're very sincere about. They are sincere about this. End of story. You can take it in or not, you know. How um, difficult or not difficult was it to like coordinate what they were saying with the moments when they turn up? It's all was it you time? know perfect. No, we just really followed you know, we were really trying to make as perfect a replica as we could. A couple of mistakes were made. We, we had about three bad takes, and then we finally got him to get through. I think Alan helped me cut this thing, so he might remember better than me. Um, but anyway, until it kind of kept going, and we, but you'll see a couple of moments where the younger woman who's typing misses a cue, and the other one's kind of waiting for her to get going or something like that. So it's not, not a perfect replica, it's pr but we were trying to make a perfect replica. So when they stopped, what was on TV was up to us, but when they stopped in their text, in the scum text, and watched for 45 seconds and then started again, that's basically based on, you know, there was no other set of choices to make except try and make a replica, which meant you know, one woman, one younger woman, we found an old typewriter, we found an old TV, that it, you know, just like I did with uh, what Froki taught, as a kind of way to make it, because if you didn't do that, then what the fuck was it, you know? <laughs> then it was neither here nor there. How did you time what was going on with the television, like, you know what I mean? with? Like when they stop talking to that's that replicates the French. Okay. The only thing that's not a replication of the French is that I don't. I guess. Oh no! I think I'm asking. Sorry. Like with what's showing on the television. What's, you know what I mean? Like we just sat there and kicked it around. I mean, yeah. I don't okay. know if there were any okay. rules. You know? okay. I don't know if there were any rules. Okay. But it seemed to work in the French, so we just, you know, as well as we could. Yeah sitting in Joanna's apartment <laughs> with months and months of TV footage. <laughs> but, showing, but, the, was the French version showing right wing? Uh, no, it's just TV. showing, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the French networks. This is back in three networks in every company, ABC, NBC, but whatever they are in France. Um, but all male announcers, this is before they were women. and. Uh, doing news stories, all news stories. Um, the one I always remember to tell about, there's one story which just really hit me hard. It's about, the, this is during the Troubles in Ireland, as they call it, and at one moment the women, both Protestant and the Catholic women at Belfast, decided to have a march together because their kids were getting killed every day in the streets of Belfast. And um, there, the news story was about how the leadership of the IRA was furious and felt betrayed by the women 
for collaborating in this peace march. And there's just nothing to say about that, you know. It's just how lost you can be, how far out you can go that you can't come back to anything. But they really tried to punish the women, the Catholic women, for participating in this march. So that's the story I remember. There's another one. This is the period of strife in South America and uh, armed forces in Argentina or something like that. You know, this, this is, it's a collection of stuff, but so we couldn't match that footage. We just took the most, um, the footage that would, that's scaring a lot of people in Poland really right now. It really is going seriously right wing. You know what baffles me is like all these right wing um, politicians in the United States and like all the, you know, um, anti-choicers and like all these bills. Someone is having sex with these men. Yeah. Like, how is that possible, <laughs> and why don't they, like, why don't people, you know, I, I was at a talk, you know, Eliza Bear, yeah. and, and we were talking. I didn't know she was still alive. I oh, know yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I know her from the 60s. And yeah. And haven't we been in touch with like, her. like, how do you, you know, like, with these, you know, resistance movements, and, like, how do you really stop these, like, men, or stop, you know, certain things from happening, and, like, how are people, ha how? If you stop having sex with them, like maybe that's effective. It's been shown to like stop wars, and you know, it's, it's an old a, Greek play, I think. Yeah, where yeah. the, the so women much. refuse to have sex with men to yeah. stop war. Like, I the one that gets me is the uh, shut down Planned Parenthood. Right. They're anti-abortion and they want to shut down Planned Parenthood, which something like three fifths of people on Medicaid use for their all their women's health needs, including contraceptives. So they, they don't want any abortions, but they want to shut down Planned Parenthood. I mean, we're at the point where you can't even follow arguments. Mm -hmm. They don't make any sense. We're, we're imploding. More than, more than half the babies today are delivered by Medicaid. Yeah, I, I saw that today. Really? Yeah, cut it out. Yep. I know. It's, I mean, we're, we're in an obs we're, you ever see Ubu Wah, the play? Oh, what? Ubuwa. It's a French play no. by Anthony Nartaud in the absurd moment. You're too young. No. You're all too young. I mean, I know so does. Kind of the beginning of theater of the absurd. Anyway, this character comes out in a, you know, the kind of horse costume that you ride. And he's the king. Rock. rock. I'm not saying it well. It's <laughs> Ubu king. King Ubu. And it's an absurd age, and he says, my men, where are my men? And he's waving some kind of cardboard saber around, you know. But it's just, it's a, it's theater of the absurd because at that point, not just in French theater but everywhere, th things were coming to some kind of head like this, where it was impossible to make a straight statement, you know. <laughs> like I, that's not a good explanation. But anyway, we are in some kind of theater of the absurd, and. Um, shutting down Planned Parenthood and being against abortion and saying that you're for the poor people, make America great again by giving them health care. You know, those four things don't exactly go into the same chocolate cupcake. You know, like they're not ingredients of the same pie, you know. But they're spoken about as if there's some, there's, you know, there's logic that the word, the word, is the center of all law and the organization of all society, contemporary society, uh, that there's a comprehensible meaning there. But we're in the non-comprehensible moment, you know. And, uh, and in some way, it's the right time for Valerie Solanas to come back, because oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, she, she, she's got something to say. You know. yeah. She cuts it. She does. Yeah. And you don't have to buy it all, but you have to think about it all. All right, dear. My dears. You yeah. lasting people. <laughs> Thank you. But if nothing else, I wrote this last sentence, which is good. You should learn from this long tale of filmmaking that some things do turn into other things which turn into opportunities you couldn't have dreamed of. One day you're in Poland making a film about Jerzy Grotowski 
then you're in New York making a film about being in, po in, being in Poland, then you're watching a 69 German film on 2nd Avenue in New York 25 years late after it was made, and you're making an English replica of it in 1998 in South Bend, Indiana. Then you write an article about the act of killing and someone reads it in Poland and soon enough you're having a retrospective in Warsaw. And then a year later, Ernie and Sherry show you a French, 1976 French film called Scum and you're back in Poland making a Polish replica of that film. And soon enough, you're here on Canal Street showing these films. So that is how it happens to me anyway. <laughs> and this, oh, I'm arguing that you should follow your nose and make the things and they'll take you to other things and you'll learn a lot. My whole trip's been learning everything. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's amazing the stuff that gets recycled. Rethought, yeah. Yeah, because the, the, many, many years ago, uh, when I was in the Air Force, I, uh, there was a, a tape that was being passed around um, about, uh, it was a, a joke, sort of a joke tape, only it was really, really black humor. Um, and guy, a guy, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was a guy. Thing, you know? I thought I mean, that's. Yeah, we were all guys. I know. <laughs> I would expect it to be a guy thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I mean, but the thing, the weird thing, I mean, and it was re like I said, it was really black humor. I mean, I played it for some of my hippie friends when I got out of the service, and they were just horrified at me when they were going to come back. What was in that tape? The way we have to hear the story. Yeah, well, yeah. So, so years later, I, you know, and it, basically what it was was that what was in the tape was a, um, it was a narration of uh, a fighter pilot, a phantom fighter pilot. Uh, who was stationed in Vietnam, uh, talking about the bombing missions that he was flying. Um, and it was horrible, you know, I mean, it was like, uh, yep. so, and, and the idea, the, the black humor part of it was that he would say these, th the, there was a wing information officer there to, uh, to make sure that the real Air Force story was told. In other words, to kind of gloss over it, you know. Because, um, you know, he'd say, so uh, what do you think of the F-4 Phantom City? Well, it's a fucking maneuver. You can fly up your own ass with it, you know. And so in the wing information officer goes, well, what the captain means is that we found the F-4C to be highly maneuverable and, you know, capable of carrying out all those missions and all this crap, you know. Um, and, you know, and it goes on from there. I mean, it gets into napalm, too. I mean, and, but the weird thing was, is like, just not too many, just a what, just maybe a few years ago, I saw Chris Marker's uh, film on, um, the uh, Grin Without a Cat. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a, as part of that film, it has this Air Force pilot um, going through I the think. whole thing, you know, and it's, it, it, all came, it all came out of this training film that was. Uh, oh, oh, that was an official training film. It was an official training film. Because the guy is. The guy's napalming this village, and he's going, "Look at him burn! Look at him burn!" You know, Holy I mean, he, yeah, this is a, but this is the real dream, yeah. Now, you know, yeah. Um, no, my care. You know, I don't know where the hell he got that training film. <laughs> That's like the biggest validation of the Scum Manifesto. Yeah, it's a, it's it's actually a very good. Have you ever seen Winter Soldier? The film Winter Soldier. Yeah. yeah. There's not much more to say about that war after that. You know. yeah. And that's not the half of it. Yeah. I mean, but on we go. Yeah. On we go.